postpartum pad tutorial. Um, this is just going over how I make the postpartum pad. This is also padsicle, so it has a an ice pack, um, reusable ice pack. What makes this um, pad tricky to make is getting it so that there's a slot where you can put the uh, the ice pack. Um, and that's what makes the whole thing more difficult to sew. There are definitely more steps involved. And so if you want to try and tackle something like this at home, this is, uh, this is how I do it. Um, because this is kind of a difficult process, I think it only really makes sense to do these in larger batches. Right here, I've got six that I'm going to do. Um, <clears throat> this one is completed, so I'm kind of showing you the different stages and steps. I will be doing some sewing so that you can see those pieces. Um, so, uh, well, let's start with an overview of the finish pad. <clears throat> the finish pad is about 15 inches long. And I do an extra wide wing on this one with uh, two sets of snaps, just so that there's plenty of stuff to go around the underwear and hold it in place. Um, I use a flannel backing. I don't use the Wind Pro or Micro Fleece or anything made of a synthetic um, fiber. Uh, one of the biggest issues with things like the, any plastic fleece, any polyester fleece, is that it constantly releases microplastic. It does that in the wash, but it also does that when you're wearing it, and microplastics can kind of get everywhere. And so when you're healing postpartum, you definitely don't want microplastics. Um, so I only use, on the exterior, it is 100% natural fiber, so it's all 100% cotton. I do use a PUL polyurethane laminate that has a polyester knit and then the polyurethane, but that is a hidden layer so that it does not actually come into contact with anything. And it's not the micro fleece, so it's not really constantly putting out anything. And then I use all 100% uh, cotton thread because, again, polyester is going to release some microplastics and I don't want that against your skin. Um, so 100% cotton on the outside, 100% cotton threads. Um, I do these quilting stitches in on the, the top layer. Um, that helps me. It helps keep the, the, the upper core firmly connected to the top um, fabric so that it's you know easier for you know, anything like any blood or anything to, to reach the core quickly. Um, the quilting also is it's 100% cotton, so it's a wicking um, thread. And then I also do these little micro perforations. Um, I use this. This is just a basic rotary cutter uh, with a perforating wheel. And the perforating wheel just cuts these little, that's probably four millimeter um, cuts every uh, eight nine millimeters so it's just a, an occasional little cut um, through the top fabric and what that does is it gives just a teensy little bit of fray so when you wash and dry these it'll fray a little bit um, and that just makes it much easier so things like blood or menstrual fluid if you're using these um, after you know postpartum um, but anything is just gonna it instead of like rolling off of the whole thing it'll catch on these little perforations these tiny little frays um, and get pulled in the core more quickly this is a great tool for that. Um, I now I, I do this on all of my pads now. Every pad that I make has micro perforations on the surface. Um, okay, so I think that's most of the surface prep. Um, let's talk about the materials that I use for the cores. I do a two core system. Um, this core it's a really floppy material as you can kind of see. Um, the Zorb is also pretty floppy, but not not just not as heavy. I don't know if you can really. It feels different. I don't know if you can really see the difference in how they move. Um, this is heavy organic bamboo fleece. It's two layers of heavy organic bamboo fleece. And then I do cotton muslin um, as a, a backer before I serge the entire thing. Um, the cotton makes it nice because in the end, I'm going to bring the cores together and serge around the, or stitch around the perimeter. And that means that it's going to be empty in the middle. And so when you put the ice pack in, the fabric here where that's kind of exposed to the ice pack and to the wash and everything is just that finished cotton. So the cotton muslin acts as like a barrier, but it also helps to stabilize the core. So two layers of heavy organic bamboo fleece. That's um, 400 um, grams per square meter in each of them. So that's a 800 uh, GSM core right here. And then in the lower core, I use Zorb Original, but I use it with uh, the Silvador. And Silvador is an antimicrobial treatment, and it's it, it's antimicrobial because it's silver, um, 
and it's supposed to be, you know, it's safe for skin and direct skin contact. But um, as with most things, that means that it's going to interfere with microflora. And I don't want that so close that it could interfere with, say, vaginal flora. Um, and so you, you just, the antimicrobial, I want it deep in the core so that it prevents, you know, anything from growing inside the pad, but not so that it prevents things from growing on your skin because your skin is alive. So I use the Zorb Silver only in the deeper layer. Um, and then again, it's just so that it's there. It prevents things from growing inside the pad, but does not interfere with the skin. Um, in order to make all that work, you got the quilting, uh, you need a space in between everything. That's where it gets tricky for making this pad. So take your top fabric, um, take your top core, the heavy organic bamboo fleece core, attach that to the top again with the, the muslin layer facing away and the organic bamboo fleece layer facing the top. Um, stitch the perimeter, and then you do these quilting stitches. I just do a nice little wavy stitch on uh, my brother. No, it's a Singer Heavy Duty machine. You just set it to the, the wavy stitch. Whatever kind of stitch you could do right there. Um, I do a longer stitch length, three and a half millimeters, because it doesn't need to be really fine stitching here. You can just have it uh, like almost basting stitches. Not quite basting, but pretty loose. Uh, okay. Once you have that done, then you have to attach the Zorb core. Um, so let me see here. I've already attached those to these. Do I still have one that needs it? No. Okay. Well, I've already attached my Zorb cores to all of my sample pieces. Um, oh, except for the white one. Oh, can't do that. Um, so I make two colors of pad, um, really colorful. And then I make this one that's completely white. The reason for the, the pure white one, and this is just a, a white Kona cotton. The reason for doing the pure white one is so that bleeding patterns postpartum are really easy to observe and, and keep track of. Um, so you can see what's going on. Best way to clean stains and things like that um, is soaking in like an OxyClean. Um, always wash on cold, rinse cold, wash cold. Uh, heat will set the stains because blood is a it's a protein stain, so it'll set the stain. Um, gray thread, white thread. Um, these I only use the 100% cotton white thread. Um, but for everything else, I use this gray thread, Guterman. If you can... There. Guterman, 100% uh, cotton thread. It's a high quality uh, 50 weight three ply thread. Um, Egyptian cotton, and it, it's really well spun. So. Um, I love this thread. It's really sturdy, looks good, holds really well, um, and sews really nicely. So I don't have an example pad to stitch a Zorb core onto, but bottom line, um, for stitching the core, I leave a large opening in the back. So I just, I use Wonder Clips, um, and I use the Jumbo. Yeah. There's a jumbo clip. There's like the regular size wonder clip. So um, I use this one when I'm doing these. Then I just kind of all the way over in the very back. Like that. And then I stitch the perimeter all the way through and it's facing down on the machine so I can just hit the perimeter and I can watch exactly where I'm at. You don't want to get too close to the edge um, because then you're not holding on anything but if you get too far away then that edge could kind of curl back. Um, again back here you don't need to get really close you want this to be pretty open. The reason for that is when you come down later on you want to be able to turn this top fabric down and then down again so that it goes over this opening. And this is, this is what makes the whole process more difficult, is this finishing piece so that you can, when you do this, you'll stitch it all together, and that gives you your opening, and then you'll top stitch. And because of all that, you don't need to worry about how far you come up with the cores. The cores, I mean, this is pretty close. I could definitely, you know, stop my stitches down here instead of up here, and that would be great. 
So in the end, you want to be able to fold this over and then stitch it down so that it's just held in place and that finishes up. It makes it sturdy for, you know, wash and dry cycles, but still leaves that access for the ice pack. Um, this has to go on after you've done your quilting stitches. Um, and that way you have the two cores. This core right here is stitched to the top fabric. And then this core is not. And that's what makes the big difference is that you got all these quilting stitches between this core, but they don't go all the way through to that core. Um, all right, so the next step for these is attaching the flannel. Um, I try and use flannels that, um, and these are postpartum, so uh, with other things, I don't necessarily make them gendered, um, but with postpartum, because it, I mean, that is essentially motherhood, um, I do use uh, more gendered fabrics like this one. Um, but only for the color. For the white ones, they're just solid white. Um, I use a solid white 100% cotton flannel for that. Um, all right, let's adjust the camera. Maybe not get my belly. All right. Um, one of the other things that's nice about flannel, and you'll see that in my other videos, is um, because it's um, this, this brushed cotton, it's kind of a grippy fabric. And so once I lay down the top fabric like this, it stays in place and everything just moves together. Just line it up, and I've got my sewing line already drawn on here with a washable marker. So that'll wash out when I do the wash before I ship everything out. Um, I'm going to use my brother uh, PQ1500. It's a fantastic machine. I love it. I mean, it was not cheap. Um, it's a faster stitch machine, semi-industrial. Um, you can definitely use a, a regular home machine. It's not that big a deal. Um, this is just my preferred option because it's uh, really good. It's a straight stitch only, so I can't do anything decorative, but... It does a great job. Um, so the turn hole in this, when you're, uh, I like to do a, a fine stitch length, so 1.6 millimeter when I'm doing my, uh, my my sewing line before I turn. Uh, the fine stitch length just means that it's going to be much stronger, and I do a pretty wide. So I mean, I've got it drawn out with a turn hole like this. I'm going to leave it much wider, um, and I'm going to, which is I'm, well, I'm going to make my turn hole pretty wide because there's a lot of bulk that I have to try and pull through. Um, you do want to come all the way up, so you just go ahead and make your full top stitch. Oh, I'm forgetting a step that's actually pretty important. Getting ready for the turn. Once you have this all lined up, here we go. So, um, what I'm going to do is that whole last process, the end process of turning your fabric over and then over again. Reverse this here. I'm going to fold this in and eventually have that folded over there, like that. Um, we're going to want to do the same thing with the flannel. It's going to turn and it's going to turn again, but this will hold. This whole thing will be turned inside out, and so this flannel will be going over this lip of this core. Um, so I, before I get to that point, I like to go ahead and even these out, and then I'm going to do a quick little initial fold, basically like that, and get it ready for me to turn it again after I turn. And that just makes the whole top stitch much, much smoother. So once these are pinned together so I know they're in a good shape, I'm going to do a quick trim. And now I'm going to use my smaller wonder clips for this. Nice and even. Nice straight line to the back point there. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the flannel in a in a second. So first I'm gonna take this. I'm just gonna do a quick basting stitch at three and a half millimeters. Just to hold that that flat. Um, and that way when I go to turn and top stitch. It'll be much easier to manage, and everything will match up. That's that side. And you can see it's just real simple, real big stitch. Same thing 
here. I'm going to move this out of the way while I stitch this. So I'm only basting, just a quick baste to hold that. Um, you could certainly iron this instead, but here I've got the machine. I'm about to stitch around, so I'm just real quick with it. Now that that's done, I'm gonna connect these guys just so that they hold in place while I do my line back to the 1.6 millimeter stitch length. And I back stitch a couple times right at that first point for the turn hole, um, just so that it's really, uh, really reinforced stitching for when I go to turn adjust the camera here. All right, I think this camera angle is going to be better for seeing what I'm doing in here. So I just did some back stitching right here at my turn hole. I'm just going to continue. Again, here I'm using the 1.6 millimeter stitch length. The really fine stitch length just means that this is going to be much stronger for when I go to turn and kind of uh, straighten out and press those, those inner seams. So I'm going to take my time, follow my sew line, This is one thing, so because this is such a large pad and it's kind of you know, floppy and uh, there's a word I'm looking for, but it's difficult to control, um, I'll bring it up and just kind of curl it over on itself. So instead of it just like laying back there, I'm going to hold it up here and it just makes it much easier to, to deal with curves and, and sewing around things like that. Just like at the beginning of my of my stitch here, I'm going I'm doing back stitch twice so that I'm really reinforcing that turn hole. All right, there we go. Now it's time to trim all the excess. <clears throat> this is a pretty straightforward process. Make sure that you can see it. Oh, coffee, always good. If you have a rotary cutter like this, this is a 28 millimeter rotary cutter. This is great for curves. Um, anything larger, like the 45 millimeter rotary cutter, when you're trying to do a curve, you're gonna end up like twisting that blade a bunch, and then you can, you know, it dulls the blade and it won't cut quite properly in that area. With the uh, 
28 millimeter. Great for these curves. Just really quickly getting the trims out. Here you're leaving um, at least a quarter of an inch uh, seam allowance here. Um, so at least a quarter of an inch. Um, I like a three eighths to half inch just for uh, the top stitch to really have something to grab. Uh, but then you're going to trim like the outside corners and cut the inside corners so that you don't have weird tension or weird weird bunching. And I forgot to add PUL. Um, this is why this is why it's important to do these in batches so that you remember all of the things that you're supposed to do. And when you do them in a batch instead of just one at a time, um, I like to do it kind of assembly line, get everything done for each step, and that's why I've got a whole bunch that are all attached, but don't have uh, flannel on them yet. So polyurethane laminate, um, I just use a basic PUL. I use lightweight, so there's very little to it. It's got the same thickness of the waterproof layer, the, the shiny side, but the polyester knit on the back that reinforces it is really thin. Um, it's got some stretch to it in both directions. Um, I also have gotten just like the PUL and you can like iron this on and just kind of adhere it to everything so it's just the film without the polyester. If you really want to avoid polyester, that's an option. I found that it was really difficult to work with. Uh, um, that's that. Before you close this up, because once you stitch this on, every anything that's there is gonna be attached. So I like to run a lint roller just to make sure everything has been removed. something. Um, let's get rid of this little. Right. And there we go. Oh, back to my jumbo clips. <clears throat> so what I'm doing here, shiny side down, um, and I do it up here. And there are lots of different ways to approach this. Um, many sewists will actually attach PUL and everything at the same time instead of doing like I just did my sewing line stitch and now I'm doing this. I prefer to make that to, to wait and do a second time uh, for a couple different reasons. One, it means that I have a sewing line that I can follow on the reverse. <clears throat> um, because the shiny side is up, it means that this is going to be against the sewing machine and can move very freely. The sticky side, the shiny side, is one of the difficult things to sew with. So this way, the polyester knit side is on the bottom, shiny side facing the cores of the pad, which is what you want anyway. Um, and then I can see my stitch line there. And now when I reverse, again, I, I follow this stitch line, same stitch length, but now I've reinforced the stitching. So now I have a double stitch and it's really, really durable. Uh, get my form back in here. So I'm just going to follow my original stitch line. A little to reinforce, not important now that we've already done one. And again, the unruly, I'm just going to fold it over. Take your time. This machine will go plenty fast, not like a commercial unit, but. 1500 stitches per minute. I mean, it's much faster than most home machines. No need to go fast.
again. Then we're going to trim some of the other pieces. So when we're doing this, anything that's too close, that's the if there's a lot of fabric outside of the stitch, um, especially any point that's going to be turned inside out, that's going to create a clump. And so the most important pieces are like outside corners, like right here. As with any other, anytime you turn a top stitch, this is something that you got to do. You got to snip your outside corner because this is going to be like this is going to go this way and this is going to go this way when it's turned inside out and so you want that to over to not overlap. If you don't do that, this would overlap this way and then this guy's gonna do that and then you have that overlap and that gets all bunchy and lumpy and that's what you wanna that's what you want to avoid by snipping the corner so that there. So that when it when you turn in top stitch it does this instead of that. There are some other approaches to this. If you do all like smooth curves, if it's a really smooth curve, then you don't have those outside corners. Um, and so you don't have to come back and trim. Some sewists really prefer that. Um, what I found is the finished product, if you have a really smooth line, then when you go to, you know, fold it around the gusset, the smooth line means that there's not a clear point for it to just fold over. And so the whole thing ends up being curved like this, or rather, uh, how best to demonstrate. Um, <clears throat> so a curved line means the whole thing just curves upside down. And when you want something like this, um, you want it to catch everything and let it absorb. So this this clear corner means that when you do close it, it's got a really clear little point and it doesn't pull the rest of the pad down and it allows it to sit like this. So um, there's a benefit, it's a little bit more work to come through and cut all of these, but the end result is ends up being uh, better for what we're using it for. If these were not, you know, pads that need to conform to a human body, and then, then maybe if you were just turning and top stitching something else, then that would be great. But these are for a human being, and human beings are curvy and they need things to, to, to fit right. All right. And then on these rounded ones, I do like to make sure that they've been trimmed appropriately. Again, about three eighths of. Uh, seam allowance and the tighter the curve the closer you want it so the smaller the, the tighter the curve the smaller the seam allowance should be so that you don't end up with lumps along the perimeter when you top stitch okay. all right happy with that now before we top stitch again lint roller i wish that there were a better alternative the wastefulness of a lint roller, but everything that I've tried that's natural or 
eco-friendly just does not do the job and because once you turn a top stitch whatever you left in here is permanently in there I like to make sure that you get it all out so lint roller is all right now it's time to top stitch or to, to turn not top stitch yet it's a big pad there's a lot of layers here it gets pretty bulky I like to stop start at the very top and just start pushing it through and at some point it just becomes impossible and then I go to the turn hole just grab hold and start to pull through once you have a nice little grip on there you can pull on those wings start pulling everything through Again, this is why we have that reinforced turn hole. There's a lot coming through. There we go. Okay. Now I use this is a, a 16 inch chopstick. It's a coating chopstick. Um, I've sanded down the end so it's nice and round. I put some rubber bands on the other end so that it, it's got some like grippy. And then I just you know into the turn hole. And this is between the flannel and the PUL. And you're just going to gently round out the corners. All those turn seams, just to poke out the wings. You don't want to push too hard. If you push too hard, you can push through the, the flannel fabric. If your seam allowances are not wide enough, then you can just pull your stitches right out of the fabric. So you want to be gentle as you're going through this process. But you don't want to be gentle but thorough. All these corners. And I like to run all along the entire seam, just pushing it out so that, you know, we're fully getting to that actual sew line. Alright, so we're ready to top stitch, um, but this is where we come back to this opening for the ice pack where you've got all these layers. Um, here's the top layer, you got that upper core, you got the opening, lower core, polyurethane laminate, and then the flannel bottom. And this is where we're going to tuck the whole thing in. So we're going to turn the whole thing in, but make sure that when you turn it, you have this overlap in your lower core. Turn the whole thing in. The PUL laminate, depending on how it, how well it's trimmed, that's a little bit long, so um, I'm gonna give it just a little bit of a trim so that it does not stick past the flannel in the final result. So, a little bit off. And now when we turn this in, what we end up with is a really nice access point. We're just going to do a little bit of stitching to hold that down, hold that down. It's like tack stitching. We're not actually going to go all the way to the edge, which would be impossible because of the way that the sewing foot works. Uh, but at this point, this is the only way to, to finish this product. Um, so you do this before you top stitch because the top stitch is going to make it even more difficult to reach the back end. Um, sometimes I will change out this particular foot uh, for this foot. 
just because it's, you know, teensy bit shorter and a smaller, you know, back on it. So you can get a little bit closer to the back. It's not that big a deal. I don't think you can really see it all that well. I'm trying to block some of unnecessary light. Yeah, you can't see it very well. But um, it gets a little bit in the way. So I'm going to... What's the best way to... I'm going to try and adjust the camera for this. Okay. Totally different camera angle. Um, so we have this turned. We're closer in. Maybe you can see all these little details better. Um, so the flannel overlaps. The POL is back there, but cut back just a little bit. So the whole thing is just going to fold in like that. Find your happy place. Maybe some clips, just to make sure that everything stays where you've lined it out. And then we're just going to come in here. And again, this does not need to be a complete stitch from all the way back. And again, we're going to hit this closure, so I'm not going to be able to go back very far. Okay. Let's see how far I can get my back stitch before the foot runs into the seam. Yeah. So... Needle right there, I mean, it's a good inch away. That's okay, we're just, just closing everything up. Get what you can in. Nice and reinforced. So again, it's, it's just right here in the middle. You just got about, just right here in the middle, you got about an, an inch of stitching that's just holding everything down, and that's good enough. Exact same thing on the top fabric. Top fabric is folded over the top, core, the upper core. I'm just gonna put this in here. And there it is. Just this little bit of stitching goes through and holds everything. So now we are ready to top stitch, and then we've got this pocket for the uh, the ice pack. So I'm gonna get my extension right out. Mm -hmm. And now it's just top stitch time. And I'm going to do this at two millimeter stitch length. So it's, you know, not really big, but not not, not particularly important at this point. And of course that point so that, you know, this is a wear spot. It's going to get open and closed and pulled around. So you want to make sure that that's reinforced. I'm just going to follow our get to these corners you want to try and pull them out and make sure that they're nice and flat this is when we did that we snipped the inside corner before we turned the top stitch um, if we hadn't then it would be pulling the whole thing closed and by snipping it in it lets it kind of flatten out
skip stitches on there. Especially with something like this, when you have this many layers, it gets really thick. Things that are really thick, you can have some skip stitches. You have to go back and fix that. Skip stitches can be difficult to diagnose. Sometimes it's tension, sometimes it's <clears throat> well, the wrong needle size for the thread size. Sometimes it's a worn needle. For some reason right here, it really doesn't like stitching through this. So uh, the only thing left to do for this is to add snaps, and I just use cam snaps. Um, again, I do a double snap, so that is just there's plenty grabbing. Um, and then again, with these nice sharp uh, corners for the wings, it means that the whole pad is going to be better able to sort of cup, or, um, so that when it sits in the underwear, it's actually going like this, so it'll catch flow instead of sitting like this. Um, I think that's it for this tutorial. That is it for this tutorial. Um, I hope that it was uh, useful. Again, these are not easy to sew. It takes a lot of time and patience, maybe some practice as well. Um, but it, there's there's a lot of steps uh, to making it so that you can do an ice pack in there. But I think that's the most critical piece of this whole thing is an ice pack. Um, without that, it's just a menstrual pad. And, um, you know, maybe Uber, super, super, super heavy. This is um, at least 1600 GSM, which is much more than most super, super plus pads. So extremely absorbent. Um, but the, the ice pack that allows you to have um, this, this padsicle piece, uh, that's what really makes us postpartum for healing. Um, but also, I mean, for anything, um, it's a groin ice pack. So there are a lot of different, you know, like vaginoplasty or vaginal rejuvenation, anything anything that, that needs some time for healing. Um, ice reduces bleeding and things like that. So um, can be beneficial for a lot of reasons. Um, but again, making it so you can have an ice pack in there is the trickiest part. Thanks for joining.